All right, folks, welcome back to the show. It's time for another episode of the Agency Freedom Podcast. We help insurance professionals move from captivity to freedom. And this is a fun episode because I have to dig a little bit deeper. Our guest here is none other than Jackson Frazio, the co-founder and CEO of Quandry, which is a very interesting company, headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia, up in Canada, and they are leading the charge in certain elements of the AI game. Now, why do I say I have to dig a little bit deeper? Because my man Jackson is an experienced podcast guest. He's been on a lot of episodes of shows that you and I both know and are familiar with. What does that mean for me? Well, I've got to give you something different. So we're not going to have just another episode with Jackson Frazio. We're going to get into a little bit more current events, maybe get Jackson to spill a little bit of hot takes, like get some get some fresh opinions from him on things that he may, may not be freely volunteering unless a specific question was asked. Jackson, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, glad to uh, glad to be here, James. Thanks thanks for having me. You know, AI is the buzzword of 2024. Generative AI, if I'm being specific. Second half of 23, too, to some extent. I feel like VA and virtual employees had a good run for two or three years of being the really hot topic that everybody seemed to be talking about. Generative AI is without a doubt in the spotlight right now. Thanks in part to OpenAI and their ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 platforms and mm -hmm. uh, all the iterations of generative imaging and I mean really just some fascinating stuff happening in the world of generative AI. Um, first question I'm going to have for you after we talk about the bio biography stuff, your biography and Quandry's biography, uh, just to set this aside, is how in the world do we make sense of such an innovative, disruptive technology in the context of an industry that is very well known for being not the friendliest place for innovation? Uh, so tuck that aside. Let's talk about your biography. What's the Jackson Frazier story? How in the world did you come to be uh, a co-founder of a generative AI company, and uh, then we'll talk about Quandry after that. But take us away, man. What's the Jackson story? Yeah, sounds sounds great. And the two the two are linked. Uh, Quandry's biography definitely definitely ties in with with my own. Um, so I, I grew up in a, a small town in northwestern Ontario, a small town called Kenora, basically a town of about 15,000 people. Um, in a beautiful area of Ontario where there's a lot of really beautiful lakes around kind of cottage country type type place grew up grew up there um, and you know I was always really interested actually in entrepreneurship so I've, I found a quandary with my brother Jameson um, we started started the business together and uh, by virtue of our parents we both love to read you know, we always read a lot when we were younger and, and going through high school and, and things like that. And books that really appealed to both of us um, from an early age were always biographies, right? Reading amazing stories of people who had gone to do great things, whether those were, you know, political bios like, you know, presidents or, you know, Nelson Mandela, like biographies like that, I always found found amazing. Um, or, you know, business leaders like uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, biographies like that of, you know, what they've been able to build and, and impact they've been able to have on the world. Um, so that always really sort of appealed to appealed to both of us from a from an early age. Um, but grew up grew up in Kenora, you know, played played a lot of sports, spent a lot of time out on the lake. Um, I realized that I wanted to go and pursue something in business. I, I had a hunch that it was entrepreneurship, but that wasn't really something that, you know, growing up in a small town that you sort of see a lot of people around you, around you doing right. The successful people are the sort of doctors, the lawyers, things, things like that. Um, so that wasn't really a, a sort of model that I had in my head. It was something, you know, I'd read about. And I think that sort of gave me the, um, the possibility of it, but it wasn't really a model of like the people, people around you. And I knew that I wanted to go far away for, for school. Um, I love my family, love, love where I came from, still spend a lot of time back there, but I wanted to sort of open up, open up my horizons a little bit and go, go far away from home and, and have a bit of a bit of a new start. So I had, I went out West for school, did my, uh, did my undergrad at the university of Calgary. And it was then that I realized that sort of entrepreneurship was 
you know, what I, what I really wanted to do. Um, I had always had that in the back of my mind, but I actually remember pretty clearly um, one day reading uh, the four hour work week by, by Tim Ferriss. I'm not sure if yep. you've, you've read that. Oh yeah. Um, amazing. I, I really love Tim Ferriss and I've, you know, listened to a lot of his stuff, read a lot of his stuff, but I remember that book specifically, like really opening my eyes of thinking, Oh, this is like, this is possible. You know, it's possible to go and do something like this. And I didn't want to go work four hours a week. Like, that's not what I was driving for. But the sort of um, independence and self-reliance and that you can go do something, you know, dramatically different from all these other models of a career that other people have that maybe you've seen in your personal life. So that was that was really exciting. And I think that's where it really kicked, kicked it off, that that's something I could go do. Um, so, you know, after my undergrad, I actually went and worked for a, a startup uh, startup. I was the third employee. I was basically, this wasn't my title, but I was effectively the EA to the CEO at this company. I started by, you know, helping, uh, write process documents. I did some financial modeling. I started hiring a few people. I started managing some clients. We were doing kind of a, a combination of, of a few different things, but really focused around you know, sales automation, lead generation, that, that type of thing. And I ended up leading, leading operations in that, in that company. So I was the COO there when I was about 20, 23, 20, 23, 24, something like that. Wow. We had, uh, you know, we had a team of about 30 folks, 30, 35 by, by the time I left and like built a, built a pretty good business. Um, but I was, I really had a, um, I really had a drive to do something on my own. Um, I was, I was to put it bluntly, like sort of sick of working for somebody at the, at the time. And, and I had a great, you know, great boss, great mentor, gave me tons of opportunity, but I was, um, yeah, interested in sort of seeing what I could do, what I could do on my own. And, you know, it was, a, it was at that point that I was, I was out of school, Jameson, my brother. So I did a finance degree and, uh, Jameson did a software engineering degree, my, my brother, and he was actually still in, still in his, uh, in his engineering degree at this point. And we were both pretty interested in doing something together. And we'd been kind of bouncing around a few different ideas of, of building something together, but nothing really stuck. Um, we dipped our toes into a few things, but nothing really had the, what we thought as the sort of scale or impact that we wanted. You know, we had a couple ideas. We're like, oh yeah, this, this could be a cool little business. For instance, you know, one was a uh, one was an one one of my favorites was an app actually where um, let's say James you are you know wanting to go out for dinner, right? And you're like, eh, you know, we could have like could have sushi, but also could have Greek. But I don't want to go through the rigmarole of like picking a restaurant, of opening up Google Maps or like going through Zomato and like finding all these restaurants you could go to and needing to make that decision. You could just like put in sushi put in Greek, put in like the dollar sign that you wanted and like it would pick a restaurant for you. So we thought that was pretty, pretty clever and, and would be fun. But like the sort of scale that you could build something like that and like the impact that it could have wasn't as exciting to, wasn't that exciting to us. And we wanted something sort of bigger and, and meatier. Yeah. Um, so in that initial startup that I was working at, I actually built, built an automation program in that company. Um, portion of my team was doing a lot of high volume repetitive data entry work. So I built a built an automation program to solve uh, a lot of those problems that we had there. And after doing that really sort of had my eyes open by like how valuable that could be and by how many businesses could benefit from that type of technology that are not using it. Um, yep. There's no, there were no solutions for that, you know, for like small, medium sized businesses, even, even mid market businesses. So Jameson and I, at this point, we like started talking about it and really got, really started to get excited about it. And, uh, decided to start start quandary to sort of experiment around that of really at the time what we were calling robots as a service for sort of smb and, and mid-market companies mm -hmm. when we started jameson was actually still he was still in school uh he actually did a he actually did a co-op period with the company we had just started and got school credit for it while he was still doing his undergrad Jeez. and i was still i was still working full-time when we did that and then after about after sort of the first nine, nine months or so uh, is when we both both went into it full time and, and really tackled it. But that's sort of how we kind of came to the idea of Quandry. And then there you know, have been various iterations of it since then. 
that's really how we how we got to that point. I just caught myself taking a drink from this glass here. So for those of you watching on on YouTube, you will get a good laugh at my expense. I, I realize that I'm drinking out of David Carruthers' podcast glass that he sent me after I was a <laughs> I was guest on say, I show. Thought I, I thought I recognized that glass. Oh, you definitely do recognize that glass. You yeah. probably have one yourself. There it is. There it so, is. So shout out to you, David. Thanks for always, uh, always being you, man. So, Jackson, I got to say, the – the genius of the right place at the right time, or maybe even serendipity, not not even genius. That's not something that any of us can take credit for, right? You know, you were born in the year that you were born. You were born to the family and the location that you were born, whether you believe in God or divine providence, whatever your faith background is. Uh, nevertheless, you found yourself at a certain place at a certain time with an opportunity to do something that wasn't already done and wasn't already saturated in the industries that you chose to serve. Um, I, I, I love reflecting on the, the, the thing of right place at the right time mm. with the right interest, the right skill set, all of the ingredients that have to come together to, to form whatever it is that gets founded. I mean, you pick the company, any company. You take a look at founders and co-founders and it's like, I absolutely love a good biography because it usually tells the story of all of these ingredients coming together and formulating this thing, whatever the company is. In your case, Quandry, you know, for you and Jameson, your brother, to have an interest and complementary skill sets, finance and software engineering, I don't know if you could cherry pick a better set of skills for two co-founders to have. One who's really good at operations, literally served as the COO of a startup. You think that might come in handy when you're doing the quandary thing. And then your brother, who is literally spending years developing his software engineering skills at a time when generative AI is just becoming a thing. I mean, wow, what a cool opportunity. Yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought up sort of serendipity and like timing and luck because i think often you know you talk about the story of of the company and sort of how you got to where you where you came to and it's easy for it to sound like preordained and a series of like intelligent strategic decisions that that got you there but i think like 30 percent 50 percent of you know our success and i and i think a lot a lot of people's success is that right is the serendipity serendipitous nature of it and like being in the right place at the right time and for us like we're like there's all of the sort of ingredients that need to come together um to put you in that place at that time right with the skill set and like you mentioned you know james and i having very very complementary skill sets but really strong like value alignment too which i think is really really important um but then also like the right place right time of the company yep. and i think for quandary like when we when we started, you know, that was before generative AI. That was before AI was was as buzzy as it is now. And that was also before a lot of startups were looking at the brokerage and agency space. Yeah. Whereas like I'm sure you've seen that over the last you know, when, three, when, four when years. was that? What year was that? I just so I know for context. Yeah, so uh, late twenty twenty. Okay. So yeah. RPA is very much on the scene. It has been for a long time. RPA is in full bloom. So I'm guessing you guys started in some sort of iteration of RPA before generative AI, right? Very, very much so. Yeah, very okay. much so. Yeah, Robotic so we, process automation, for those of you that haven't heard the acronym RPA, I think most of our listening audience is familiar with that acronym, but I always like to clarify just to be be on the safe side. Yeah, yeah. And when we, when we started, like we were, and sort of started out of a, uh, you know, a gap that we saw like the large RPA companies not filling, right? Like a UI path or automation anywhere where it takes, you know, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, potentially engaging a third party consultant to like spin up some of that technology. Yep. And like SMBs, mid-market companies, like they don't have the time, resources, nor really the appetite for that type of, for that type of engagement. Like what they need is something that solves a problem for them yep. you know, quickly. So when we started, we really started as a, you know, vertical, vertical RPA for the insurance industry. And we sort of experimented across different industries to start to figure out where, where the best fit would be. Worked with our first couple of you know brokerages in, in Canada, uh, pivoted to insurance pretty quickly just because we saw you know how big the pain was and really how big the how big the opportunity to come and help was. Um, 
but started initially as really like a vertical sort of productized RPA, you know, pre-packaged robots that can be deployed very quickly to solve your existing problems in a, in a very robust way. Nice. Um, since then, you know, we've now been, now been growing and obviously adapting, adapting the business. And we're actually not, um, I think this is kind of interesting. This ties into the, you know, the first question that, uh, that you were asking James around, you know, AI and insurance and innovation and all of that. We're, we're actually not using generative AI in our, in our core products right now. Um, okay. We've exper- My we've mistake. I apologize. No, not a, not a problem. And I think it's, I think people often assume we do. Um, we actually don't. It's kind of for an interesting reason in that, you know, with our, with our products right now, we've experimented a lot with generative AI, but we haven't actually been able to drive the accuracy uh, that we need for our technology to deliver like exceptional value for customers. So for us, like for a, for a, for an agency to rely on our technology to solve like really big, important, valuable problems for them, as an example, you know, reviewing all of their renewals and flagging, you know, changes, you know, risks, upsell opportunities, cross sell opportunities, all that type of, type of stuff. They need an exceptional level of accuracy. Right. Otherwise, they're not going to trust our technology. They're going to trust, you know, a person to do that. We yep. can't get, you know, a 99 percent plus accuracy rate through large language models. You can get, you know, high 80s. You can get low 90s. Um, it's really good for for lots of use cases. But for what we do, we need like an exceptional high level of accuracy. So we have to we sort of combine, you know, multiple different approaches where we use RPA, we use OCR, we use machine learning use different approaches in order to pull all of that together to get that extremely mm. high level of accuracy. Um, Man, that, that, that is such a cool point to make because for the, for the uninitiated, combining RPA with optical character recognition, oh man, it sure looks and feels like magic. And I was like, wait a second, that just happened with a, without a single keystroke from a human actor? Oh baby, now we're talking. We're cooking with gasoline. So the, um, well, how do you guys, how do you guys figure that out? How do you determine? Hey, you know what? We're going to stick with RPA, even though generative AI is a thing. It's not really accurate enough, and we're going to instead install OCR technology and pair it with RPA, so that it it sure looks and feels like a generative AI, even though it's not. But at the end of the day, it solves the the core problems that your customers and clients want it to solve. So you, you don't actually need generative AI and you're better off with a combination of RPA and OCR. That's fascinating. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think what we, you know, what we always, and you know, I'll couch that and say like, I, it is improving significantly, right? Like in GPT-5 coming out, like, you know, this industry is changing very, very quickly. And there are definitely opportunities in our tech stack for us to leverage, you know, large, large language models to, to improve things. But really the lens that we look at things through, it's, it's just customer value, right? Where is the customer value and what approach do we need to take to continue to deliver exceptional customer value? Like we don't look at ourselves as a, which I think oddly for a technology company, like we don't look at ourselves as sort of having a bunch of technology and sort of figuring out what problem we can solve with it. We are orienting ourselves around the problem first. What is the problem that we solve from customers? What is the value that we deliver to customers? What is the value we want to deliver from customers? And then what do we need to do? What do we need to pull out of our quiver in order to solve that problem? Our customers don't care what technology we're using. They want a solved problem. Let, let me drill down super far into like the individual sure. granular uh, use case. Uh, be as specific as you want. Endorsing a change to a policy in your management system. What, whatever example you want to use there. Uh, folks, for those of you that are not familiar with Quandary at all, which I would guess is a pretty large number of you, because um, Jackson, we'll get, to, we'll get into you know, compatibility in a little bit, but sure. most of the work you guys do is with applied Epic users, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, that's the main system you guys are compatible with and plugged into right now. So if you're not on Applied Epic for your agency management system, you may not be at all familiar with Quandary. And you've spent the last, oh, I don't know, close to 20 minutes now going, (laughs) James, what in the heck are you talking about? This sounds cool. It's great and everything, but I have no idea what Quandary does. 
Um, Jackson, help him out. What does Quandary do in a very granular use case? Just an example. Yeah, ab absolutely. So high level, as you probably gathered, you know, intelligent automation for brokerages and agencies, right? Automating a lot of these time consuming repetitive processes, really drilling, drilling into that. I'll talk through, you know, one, one specific use case, which is really around the renewal process. So what are, we call them, you know, robots or agents, right? Agent-based automation, these, you know, robots that log into your systems. They will log into your management system, so your, your agency management system. They will, they are one, depending on how, how large your, uh, your, your book volume is. Identify all upcoming renewals. Uh, drill down into those renewals one by one and extract all relevant data for that renewal. So that will be, you know, last year's renewal data, this year's renewal data, coverage data, limits, deductibles, premiums, discount, surcharges, uh, claims information, location data, uh, age of driver, age of vehicle, present discounts, effectively rating information, age of home, last updates, all that, all that fun stuff. Effectively, any relevant data that's there, structured or unstructured, uh, takes all of that data ingests it, understands it all, and then provides back to the agent a short summary of that renewal. You know, any major changes, dropped coverages, added, added coverages, you know, premium changes, uh, discounts that should be there that are not there, um, upsell or cross-sell opportunities, E&O risk in the book, things like that. Effectively, anything relevant that they need to act on to either retain the customer decrease e &O risk in the book, increase retention rate, increase upsell, cross-sell, um, and save a lot of time while, while doing so. Um, so that's a specific example of what, you know, what the Quandary technology does. Love it. And, and because you're plugged into the agency management system, you're able to access download data from Ivan's. You're able to you know, absorb and process, I'm guessing, updated Accord apps and process the renewal in the management system, tee it up for the human actors to then deliver it to the insured and provide their commentary, you know, record a video summary or whatever. So you're doing some of that low end data entry, highly repeatable processes that a, an in-person team member or a virtual employee would be performing were it not for Quandry. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yep. Yeah, exactly. And really what we're trying to do is enable, you know, enable the people to do more and better quality work with what they're really good at, right? Wow. Calling customers, making decisions, uh, upselling, cross-selling, evaluating risk. They can do more of it because they're getting better quality information and they don't have to put that together on their own. And we're also driving uh, better segmentation through their book of who they need to call and who they don't need to call. So they can yeah. do more of it and better quality work because they have better quality information to do that work. So basically, you took all of the virtual employee and VA companies that service agencies running Applied Epic and said, hold my beer. I'm going to show you something. <laughs> in, in your words, I guess, yes. Yeah. So why would you want to pay a virtual team member to do something you can have a robot do instead? Because robots never take breaks. They do exactly what you told them to do. And if they make a mistake, it's probably because there was a gap in instruction, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's still, you know, I, uh, there's there's definitely still a place for uh, for VAs and, and that type of work, like a a robot, like our technology, it's never going to do 100 percent of the of the sure. renewals that come through, right? Well, somebody Maybe. needs to hold the robots accountable, right? Exactly. Yeah, you got to make sure they don't. Someone's uh, got to spot check the robots. Yeah, so they spot check, they handle the exceptions, the edge cases, etc. Um, and there are, you know, there there's always going to be um, sort of smaller processes and, and edge cases that just make sense for a person to do where there's like a much higher degree of flexibility. One interesting thing, you know, about AI is that it's still like, it's still fairly dumb. Like it's really good in uh, sort of defined use cases and purposes. But yeah. what humans are really good at is like generalized knowledge across many different things, right? So you can train AI to be like really good at certain things. Um, and it can do those things really well, but you know, VAs are still really helpful when you have yeah. a lot of different things in different places and have that increased level of flexibility. You know, I've heard from a few people that one of the biggest job titles to explode in the next five years is prompt engineer. Mm. 
you know, someone who understands at a very deep level how to best interact with these generative AI systems and get the AI to do what we want it to do as its human overlords until the point when it becomes totally ubiquitous and the AI has a better understanding, you know, years from now of you know, the things that it's expected to do where, you know, minimal input is required. I'm not going to get into the whole ethical chaos thing of what happens when, you know, we, beca- you know, we get to that inflection point uh, where AI becomes self-aware and sentient and then enslaves us. We have a Skynet Terminator situation on our hands. Uh, I definitely think that <laughs> there's got to be some guardrails put in place or else that's a very real possibility that AI may just decide at a certain point it doesn't need humanity and it tries to get rid of us. Uh, but aside from, you know, fun little conversations that don't have anything to do with Quandry or, or uh, Jackson Frazio, um, I, I'm going to leave all of those talking points and questions for another conversation. Maybe around a couple of adult beverages uh, and, and a fire somewhere at a conference sometime. Who knows? That that sounds great. I look forward to having those conversations. <laughs> so I've got, people I've got a lot of opinions there, too. Oh, my gosh, man. I've seen enough sci-fi movies to know what happens when we go too far down the AI pipe without enough accountability. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, whole, uh, the whole concept of governance um, is so important. And last time I checked... You don't have any governance issues with RPA. so That, th- that you do not. No, absolutely love it. So, man, um, where do we go from here? I told you ahead of time we were going to have a few biography questions, and then we're going to just take the gloves off and figure out where to go for you know, the, the second part of the interview. What has your curiosity peaked right now? You, know, you, you are the CEO of a very innovative company, but you're also – an entrepreneur. You're also a member of this industry. And I I just, I sense in you a fellow, you know, kinship, a a curiosity that is never really satisfied. Mm -hmm. So uh, what has your attention right now? What are you reading? What are you seeing in our industry or in, you know, the world of RPA and, and automation and whatnot that has you going, hmm. Yeah, interesting. So there's two things. One is um, one is sort of internal to internal to Quandry, and then the others the others a little different. Like the one that starts sort of external, like industry wide. I think the you know there's there's so much talk about AI and automation, and like that's a you know big big part of what we do. Um, but where I actually think there's like a much more maybe not more interesting, but like an equally interesting and substantial opportunity for agencies is really around data. Um, When we work with agencies, there's a, you know, we automate a lot of these, a lot of these manual processes and that, and that drives a lot of, a lot of value, but they're, they're still like, um, there's still so much, you know, one-off work, like working on this policy and working on this policy and working on this policy. And you have to, you have to do that. But I think there's a much larger opportunity to be able to take, like ingest that entire book of business and be able to like really understand it at a global level and then direct like specific actions through that, through that book. Um, So that's something like, and you know, Quandry sort of will, will, dovetail into that obviously because like this is the space that we're in but outside of quandary and other companies and just the industry at large it's just something that i don't think is being leveraged nearly as well as it could be right brokerages agencies they really they're data companies right you you have relationships with carriers and you know and your clients um you manage those relationships and you own and process data um yep. and i don't think that the data side of it is nearly utilized as well as it could be. And I think there is a huge opportunity for agencies to run their businesses in a much more like systematic, systematic way through better usage of their data. So that's something that we're thinking about a lot right now and like looking at. um, And I think is like a huge opportunity for, for agencies to, to improve their businesses. One of the things that I, I, I see in that space well, two, I should say. You know, one is reporting, of getting mm. better access to critical metrics that provide 
quantitative information that let us draw qualitative conclusions. And that's, that's the human element. I mean, in a nutshell, robots and generative AI and whatnot are fantastic instruments for quantitative data. But the qualitative, the subjective, the, the intuition, the, the gut feeling, the inspiration, those, you know, it, you know, those feelings, those deliverables are positively human uh, in nature. I don't know how in the world you program intuition, in, in gut instinct into a machine that is bound by the laws of binary computer code or you know quantum computing which is a different subject entirely there's no way to get that human qualitative information out of a machine right now it's probably decades before we're able to do the star trek kind of stuff you know when data starts to feel things and mm. you know goes through all of that you know stuff from i'm sorry if you're not familiar with with the star trek next generation uh universe i just threw you for a loop and was like wait data what <laughs> data is a thing but now it's a person yeah I, sorry it's a star trek thing forgive me if i totally lost you just then um but the to your point i think the qualitative conclusions is really where the 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 secret sauce is are, are you familiar with Arius Analytics and their, their uh, program, yep. Donna for Agents? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I figured you probably were. When, when I think about just compiling data and helping human actors draw meaningful conclusions from it, uh, Donna for Agents and the team at Arius, uh, I um, was, saw them in, in New Orleans at Accelerate with Vertifor just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think they're doing it as well as anybody is right now. I would certainly think that, you know, as you guys are embarking on your own version of that journey, companies like Arius and products like Don have got to be an inspiration for the, the sorts of stuff that you guys are trying to do as far as qualitative conclusions. Yeah, I, the, Arius is a, is a great company. I've met, I've met Anarag a couple of times. He's extremely, extremely smart and I think is building a, is building a great company. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely inspiration. Like we look at it as, um, there's sort of elements of that, that we think could be really applicable for what, what Quandra would do. But, um, I think what they've carved out is like an amazing, an amazing niche in where they're helping agencies. And for us on our, on our data journey, like we see ourselves looking, wanting to be at more of a bird's eye view level, like not because right now we are doing, you know, we are sort of acting on like the, you know, one-to-one -one policy relationship for the, for the agency, but sort of going a, like a step higher and providing um, and interacting with that book at a, at a high level and providing that, you know, to management, to ownership, to executives, and then being able to trigger actions like through our intelligent agents based on that data. So you sort of have this feedback loop, right, where you have, you know, the agents in their processing to and should use a different term agents like our robotic agents um, in their processing data, you know, understanding it, being able to like ingest that and provide reporting back. And then based on that reporting, you know, you can then trigger actions for those agents to go back. So you have this like repetitive loop where you have like action, action triggering data and going back and triggering more action, which we think is pretty, pretty interesting. Hmm. Man, there's a lot of potential there. That's really cool. So we, you have robot agents, doing things that triggers other robot agents to do more things. So you have, you know, a daisy chain effect of your RPA processes exactly. that, you know, exponentially increases the the value to the operation. Yeah, and not just not just triggering other other robots, right? You have, you know, robots bring that data back and then based on what's brought back, some of that is going to go to people, some of that will go to agents. So like based on the segmentation and sort of the the understanding of that data, you want a big component of that to go to a person to evaluate, to make a phone call to like what you said, right? Yeah. Understand the qualitative nature of it, which you just can't, can't replace, but not all of that, not all of that needs to be done by a person. So being able to segment what goes where. Well, in compiling and delivering that in a, in a, a cadence that the user selects, whether it's daily, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever, goodness, the use cases there are limitless right and it's like you know if, if i walked into the office 
And on Monday morning, there was a list compiled by my robots at Quandry that said, hey, um, we've recognized certain indicators in the following 12 accounts that let us know they probably need to hear from you individually. Like, they would probably appreciate a phone call. Or, hey, we've noticed that these people reply faster via text rather than phone, so we think that you should probably text this person instead of call them. I, I don't, mm. Just hypothetically, it's like, I imagine response yeah. times are captured uh, pretty easily. So just having something as simple as, hey, this person responds faster via phone than text or email. Or, you know, this person responds via email and they never text. So don't text them. You know, having that kind of information at, a, at an account level would be extremely useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, exactly. And those types of things are what, what is going to become possible. I, I think it's a, you know, thinking of like the industry as a, as a whole, I think it's an extremely exciting time for, for agencies. Um, like I think for a long time there wasn't, you know, wasn't as much innovation as there should have been in the, in the agency channel. And we have definitely noticed a change over the last four years, like the amount of new companies, the amount of new innovation that that is coming to the industry is now coming faster than it was. And I think, you know, agents are the ultimate beneficiaries of that, right? If there's more innovation and more competition among, you know, companies that innovate, that means it's going to move faster. It's going to get better and you have to compete for, for agency dollars, which is a, which is a good thing for agencies. It means they get better options and more innovation. So I think it's a, a very, very exciting time for the, for the channel. Man, I couldn't agree more. Is there anything else you want to touch on before we start to land the plane here? I promised you about a 35 or 40 minute runtime and that's right about where we're at, believe it or not, we're already there. So uh, any final thoughts before we get you back to your afternoon? Um, you know, the, I'll, I'll add one more thing for all the, all the business owners listening. Like you mentioned, you know, what is the stuff that you're thinking about right now? <laughs> for me, it's like how to, how to not spend all my time working, which I'm sure that a lot of, you know, a lot of your listenership can appreciate. You can probably yes, appreciate absolutely. like it is hard to do, man, really hard to do. We have, uh, you know, we have been grinding the last like three and a half, four years. And now we've got, you know, we've got a big team. We've got a good leadership team and, you know, it's one thing to say you want to sort of have a bit more balance. It's another to do it. And I, like, you know, the hardest, one of the hardest things of doing what we're doing is, is that is like balancing the personal side of it. And, uh, Yep. And making sure that you're like taking time to rest and recharge, but so May important for like the longevity of it. Um, the only I advice I can give is good I for can, people to hear every once in a while. Yeah, I, I agree. The only advice I can give is uh, some that I received from Brandon Smith, actually, uh, up in Montana, mm -hmm. not not too far away from you there in Vancouver. Uh, you know, this was, I, gosh, it's almost two years ago now that I had this conversation with him at a conference in Phoenix. And, you know, just asking him, how in the world do you get done all the things that you get done? Because I see on his social media that he's very present with his family. He's very active uh, with kids' sports and whatnot. But he's also, uh, you know, he travels 20 or 30 times a year for speaking engagements. And he's a, an executive in, in a rather large um, insurance agency in Montana. And I just asked him, how in the world do you keep track of it all and make sure that the main thing stays the main thing. And all he said was, you have to be, this is a direct quote, you have to be absolutely ruthless with your calendar. And I, and mm. I speaking as Brandon, what he said to me was, I have to be very, very particular in what I allow to be on my schedule. And whatever that is, is intentionally selected. He's never on cruise control. And I've adopted that philosophy in the last two years. And you can ask my team, like I get out of as many meetings as I can. If anybody else on my team is fully capable of taking a meeting, well, they're going to take that meeting. I'm not taking that meeting. It's a waste of my time if somebody on my team is equally as good at a task as I am. I was like, my hours are way more expensive than their hours. So why would I do something that they can do just as well as I can? So you know, being ruthless with what I allow in my calendar and delegating as many things as possible to the right people I don't know. You're probably already doing that, but just in the off chance that you haven't put, you know, that level in, maybe that helps you. I don't know. Yeah. It, you know, I think it's, I, I think you're bang on. It's something, it's something I'm learning right now to be, to be honest of like, you know, what I need to be in and, and what I don't need to be in and how to, how to really, 
uh, allow yourself to take take that step back. And I think the one thing I've been learning with that is that the, it's better for you to not be there. It's also better for everybody else, right? For you it's better to not for the be company. there. <laughs> like it's better. Yeah, it's better for like it's better for the people who are leading those things to be able to like step in and have that autonomy and ownership and yep. allows them to grow and scale. Like it's how your business scales. It's how people grow and it's how you have a better quality of life. Like it's a, it's a, it's a self-perpetuating loop. Well, and we haven't talked about leadership at all because this is a, you know, a medium sized podcast episode. And I had a lot of questions because you're doing some super cool stuff. You know, the, the, the leadership benefits to you as co-founder and CEO when someone knows that you trust them to do something without your direct input, the intangible and tangible benefits to that person, to their team, to your company as a whole are extreme. You know, they get better at doing something without your direct input. You ask them for a debrief and they give it to you and then you trust them more, then they feel more confident so they do a better mm -hmm. job next time. This wonderful positive feedback loop that started with you saying, man, I am totally burnt this week. Hey, can you take that meeting for me? I've got to step out for a minute. And, and all these positive things happen because of that. So good for you, man. I'm really proud of you. I'm, I'm excited for you that you are exiting, you know, potentially the first biggest part of the grind. Because, I mean, founder, co-founder, whatever, you and I are cut from the same cloth in that regard. You never mm -hmm. really leave the office. Even when you're at home, you're still at the office in your head. And that, that part is something yeah. that most people will never understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's always there with you. And you know, the flip side of that is it's the, you know, it's the most rewarding, most challenging and rewarding thing I've ever done. But you, yeah. uh, yeah, you, there's a, you know, there's the cost associated with that, but well, well worth every step. hundred percent, man. If people want to reach out to Quandry and learn more about what you're doing, just for, for clarity's sake, everybody, they're not, available on all the major AMSs. Right now, it's mostly Applied Epic. I'm sure you guys will be expanding to other platforms as you're able to with development resources and whatnot. Uh, what's the best way for someone to get more information and schedule a demo if they want to? Yeah, you can go right to our website. Our website is quandry.io, Q-U-A-N-D-R-I.io. Um, should be very easy to find where, uh, where to book a demo on our, on our website or we're not doing our job properly. Awesome. And we're going to put all that information in the show notes, boys and girls, uh, so you can find uh, good people on Jackson and Jameson's team uh, to learn more about that if you want to. And even if you don't connect with them now, then he's a great follow on LinkedIn. Jameson is as well. Uh, they they get, some, get some great information out there. Uh, so definitely connect with them. On, I'm guessing LinkedIn is your preferred platform, right, Jackson? Yeah, yeah. LinkedIn is best, uh, best for me. Awesome. Hey, I appreciate you sharing some of your valuable time with us this afternoon, man. Uh, check out quandary.io to learn more. And this has been another episode of the Agency Freedom Podcast. Make it a great day, boys and girls. We'll talk to you again real soon. Y'all take care.